In this video, I'm going to investigate what independence looks like on a Venn diagram. Unfortunately, Venn diagrams are not very useful for illustrating the concept of independence, but let's see what they can show us. Not all of the plots in this video are officially called Venn diagrams, but I don't want to get too caught up in what we call them. All the plots are either Venn diagrams or Venn-like diagrams. I'm going to assume that you've already been introduced to the concept of independent events in probability. Let's start with an example. Suppose we have a situation where the probability of A is 0.3, the probability of B is 0.4, and the probability of their intersection is 0.12. Since the product of the individual probabilities is equal to the probability of the intersection, A and B are independent. In a typical Venn diagram, like we have here, the sizes of the circles do not have any meaning. So if that's the case, Venn diagrams aren't going to help illustrate independence at all. Here we have a circle representing event A and a circle representing event B. The intersection of A and B has a probability of 0.12. The entire circle of A has a probability of 0.30, so this portion has a probability of 0.18, and this portion would be the intersection of A with B complement, everything outside of B. Similarly, this portion out here is going to have a probability of 0.28, and the outside region will have a probability of 0.42. But if the sizes of the circles don't have meaning, this type of diagram isn't going to help to illustrate independence at all. We'd just be doing a calculation and seeing if the independence rules hold. But what if the sizes of the circles did have meaning? Let's try that here. Here's a similar plot, only here the area of the rectangle is 1. The area of each circle equals its probability of occurring. So the area of the circle on the left is 0.3, and the area of the circle on the right is 0.4. The area of the intersection is 0.12. Recall again the independence rules. A and B are independent if and only if the probability of the intersection is equal to the product of the individual probabilities. Here, A and B are independent, and the intersection has an area that is equal to the product of the area of the two circles. It might be easier to visualize independence if we think about conditional probabilities. If A and B are independent, the conditional probability of A given B is just the probability of A. If you recall, in general, the probability of A given B is the probability of the intersection of A and B over the probability of B. So in this plot, independence means that the ratio of the area of the intersection to the area of the B circle is equal to the ratio of the area of the A circle to the area of the entire rectangle. Now that's not the easiest thing in the world to think about. We could also make the same argument switching the roles of A and B. Let's contrast that with the dependent case. Suppose we have a very similar situation, except the probability of the intersection was a little bigger. So let's bring in another event, event C, which still has a probability of occurring of 0.4, as event B did, but its intersection with A has a probability of 0.2. So here, the probability of the intersection is greater than the product of the individual probabilities, and A and C are therefore not independent. In this case, relative to the previous situation, the circles are going to nudge closer together. Here, the area of the intersection is greater than it would be under independence. Let's look at the conditional probabilities. Here, A and C share more ground, so the conditional probability of A, given C, is greater than the probability of A. And similarly, the conditional probability of C, given A, is greater than the probability of C. Let's take a quick look at another related situation before illustrating this another way. In this scenario, the areas once again represent the region's probability of occurring. The circle on the left represents event A, and it has a probability of 0.1. The circle on the right represents event B, and it has a probability of 0.2. Here, A and B share no common ground so their intersection has a probability of zero. The conditional probability of A given B is zero right now, 
so it's less than the probability of A. I'm going to start nudging the small circle towards the right, and eventually, when the intersection is just the right size, the two events will be independent. When they represent independent events, I'm going to turn the circles green. Here, the intersection is still too small. Now we're getting really close, but the intersection is still too small. Still not quite big enough. And there we go. Here, the probability of the intersection is equal to the product of the individual probabilities. The intersection makes up one-fifth of the area of the little circle and one-tenth of the area of the larger circle. But if I nudge the little circle just a little bit to the right, then the intersection is too big and the events are no longer independent. It looks similar to the independent case, but here the intersection is just a little too big and the probability of A given B is greater than the probability of A. I know this because that's how I plotted it, using special software to do it. But it's nearly impossible to determine with the naked eye. It's a little more obvious if we move the circle over a little bit further. So it can be tough to tell if events are independent from this type of diagram, especially if the area of the intersection is close to the area under independence. Areas of circles and their intersections are difficult to judge by eye. It's much easier to estimate the area of a rectangle. So why don't we try representing events with rectangles and see what comes of that. Let's go back to the original example, where the probability of A is 0.3, the probability of B is 0.4, and the probability of their intersection is 0.12, so A and B are independent. We could represent that separately in a couple of plots. Let's again let the area of a region be equal to its probability of occurring. Here, the area of each square is 1. Event A is represented by the skinnier rectangle on the top, which has an area of 0.3, and event A complement is represented by the fatter rectangle on the bottom, which has an area of 0.7. And for event B, I'm going to make the divider run in the opposite direction. We'll see what that does for us in a moment. Event B has a probability of 0.4, and B complement has a probability of 0.6. There are four intersections of A and A complement with B and B complement. What if we were to plot those four regions in a single square? It would look like this. Since A and B are independent here, the area of each region is equal to the product of the individual probabilities. The area of A intersect B is 0.3 times 0.4, or 0.12. The area of A intersect B complement is 0.3 times 0.6, or 0.18. And similarly for the other two areas, 0.7 times 0.4 is 0.28, and 0.7 times 0.6 is 0.42. When events are independent, the area of each region is equal to the product of the individual probabilities. So the plot looks just as if we overlaid the plot for B on top of the plot for A. But that's not true if the events are not independent. Let's see what that looks like. Here we've got the second example we discussed earlier, where for events A and C, the probability of the intersection is greater than the probability of the intersection under independence. We get the same individual plots here, but A and C are more likely to occur together than were A and B. It takes a little work to figure out the next plot, but if we were to carry out the calculations, we'd see that the plot looks like this. It doesn't look like we just overlaid the plot for C over the plot for A. The probabilities of the different regions are not simply the product of the individual probabilities. If, say, we knew that event A happened, that makes it more likely that event C happened. And if we knew that event A did not happen, down here in this region, that makes it less likely that event C happened. To calculate these areas when events are not independent, we need to know more than simply the individual probabilities of the events occurring. We are told that the intersection of A and C has a probability of 0 0.20, so this area here has to be 0 0.20. And we know that A has a probability of 0 
So these two areas combined must be 0.3, meaning this area here must be 0.10. And similarly, C has a probability of 0.40. So these two areas combined have a probability of 0.40, meaning this area must be 0 0.20. And the remaining area here must be 0 0.50. Things get a little more complicated for us when events are not independent. In probability and statistics, it's often much easier to deal with situations when events are independent than when they are not.